he just has to basically his role just seems to be like PR for the <laughs> uh front office. Like he's just the like Hey guys, this is what they decided. Or the, Don't uh, shoot me. Oh, what's what's the what's the uh name of the person who gets in front of the White House uh press secretary? Oh, White he, House press yeah, secretary. Yeah. That's basically <laughs> what he does. Like the White House press secretary doesn't make any decisions, but they no. have to they have to take all the decisions and then craft a statement around spin, it. Spin them. Mm-hmm. Craft a statement around it. And and then that's why uh, Dana Brown gets on the Astros flagship and goes, hey, listen, I know things look bad right now, but this is a team that can rip off eight or nine, ten wins in a row and blah, 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 blah. And, and Guys, I know things I, look bad at the border, but, you know, we got solutions yeah, we're working like our on. President, our president is is aware of that issue and <laughs> is working for a compromise. Um, yeah, no, this is – I'm – do you want? Do we? Hear, let's hear more from Reggie yeah, Jackson. Maybe yes. we're being unfair. To yeah, Reggie Jackson, yeah, yeah, Mr. Maybe, October. Maybe, the, maybe this next clip from Mr. October. Uh, see, I think that's the real problem. He's talking in April, and he's an October guy. Like he's yeah. not. He's not really warmed yeah. up yet. Uh, but Reggie Jackson, clip number two here, uh, Johnny B, uh, on uh, passing on Blake Snell. Being fiscally responsible, I think, is what kicked us out of the Snell deal. Um, he signed a two-year deal. I want to say for sixty-two. Um, I'm, that's too much um, um, for him. He's been hurt a couple of times. Um, he, and, and I think there's incentives on top of that. He's also got an option on his own. And be, between the four or five people that make the decisions with the Astros, we don't play that game. I mean, he, he undersold it by saying four or five people. Uh... <laughs> Uh, but maybe that's who actually has a. Uh, maybe some of the some of the people. Is it, is, that, it, is it one of those things like the like a nuclear code? Like two people have to turn the key at the same time. The Astros have five people. The with killer the key. bees have to look at each other. <laughs> to uh, turn the key before the, uh, the decision on Josh Hader is made. Yeah, maybe the, maybe it's like four or five people actually get to make the decision. But Jim Crane will listen to nine of them. But you oh know, only so, four or five of them actually. I, I I don't know where you want to start with it. Let's start with the idea of fiscal responsibility. Uh, one, uh, Mr. October, uh, should I call him Mr. October? Yeah, um, just Mr. Mr. October. Mr. Mr. Jackson, Mr. October. All right, Mr. October. Uh, one, um, I, I'm glad you, you're, you're taking a fiscal responsibility because that is a way for even a great organization like the Astros or, uh, can be, can be, you know, fall apart because you put, give out too many really expensive contracts and, yeah, then, so that, and then things catch up to you. You look at, you look at the Astros like last you couple wouldn't of give seasons. Up, like, you know, you wouldn't want to give up like a contract to like, I don't know, a Rafael Montero type. That would no. be fiscally ir- irresponsible. It, very like, irresponsible. I mean, I don't know who else, Sean, who else would be fiscally irresponsible? What's another contract that um, like the Astros would never do because it's not fiscally so responsible. So like if, if someone only is hitting like three for 38 to start a season yeah. with no extra base hits right. uh, and meh first base <laughs> defense. Uh, you wouldn't want to pay. Him. No, you wouldn't want to, you, you wouldn't want to give like a 36 year old first baseman, no. like a three year deal. That's not fiscally responsible. I think another thing that wouldn't be fiscally responsible is giving a guy, and especially like if you were a player, like let's say you're a hall of fame player and your, your career ended because of shoulder injuries. I think it would be fiscally responsible for that person who has, detailed inside information of shoulder injuries derailing a career to then go out and give a $17 million contract to an outfielder who can't play because of shoulder injuries. I, mean, I think that would also be fiscally responsible. It would Is be, that fair if, to say? If he wasn't available for opening day, then it would be <laughs> fiscally irresponsible. It's just like you can't tell me, oh, we got we to be fiscally responsible and th- with that sort of track record. And look, and I like and we're, and we're ignoring the fact that this offseason they gave yes. us, they gave out yes. the, highest, yes. the highest reliever contract of all time. And I like – I was for the move. I, I have no problem with it, but you can't. It wasn't responsible. Right. <laughs> but you can't tell us then that you won't make moves because they're not fiscally responsible. We do give a 20 damn million dollars a year to a closer in setting a new record for, you know, closers on the open market on, on an annual basis. I just, the idea of they can't sign Blake Snarl again, a two year deal. It's a two year deal. You can't sign Blake Snell for fiscal responsibility reasons on a two-year deal, but then you can do all the other crap. It's also like, to me, this isn't about Blake Snell. No. This, is, this isn't just about Blake Snell. Because Blake Snell, I believe, has still only made one start for the Giants. He yeah. gave up three yeah. runs and in three innings. So, like, 
He would fit right in with the Astros. Um, <laughs> be the race. <laughs> but but they would kill for three innings. Um, Maybe we could put him in middle relief. They um, this isn't about Blake Snell because like this season has not fallen apart because they don't have Blake Snell. It's it's mostly just speaks to the overall. Like this is this is one of the guys that has basically twenty percent. Yeah, twenty <laughs> percent. Say he's got one of the keys <laughs> in what they do, and he and there's another. A uh, soundbite where he was talking about the um, the luxury tax uh, threshold, and he was like, "Yeah, I think after a certain point, you get charged like ten percent, twenty, thirty percent. I I don't know which one it is." And it's just like, "Oh my god, dude! The guy talking about fiscal responsibility doesn't know what the what the what the uh, luxury tax situation is." We're not going to replay the clip, but I'm I'm sure you noticed this. There was a lot of I thanks. Yes. And what Reggie Jackson was saying. Like, he also said that um, uh, Blake Snell gets hurt a lot. He's, he had one season where he only made 11 starts. But, like, he's not, a, He's not. I don't know, name a pitcher who always gets hurt. Like Clayton Kershaw. Yeah. Clayton Kershaw gets hurt a lot. I wouldn't put Blake Snell Lance in that category. Yeah, Lance, Lance McCullers, exactly. Keep, localize it. Uh, he he. Uh, but you don't give that guy a contract. No, you don't. <laughs> that wouldn't be fiscally responsible, Sean, to give that guy Oh my God! I'm like the Houston Astros, man. Thank God the Texans are good again because I think uh, hot take: Are we in the final days of the of the of the quote unquote dynasty? Defined days. Uh, are okay. Are the barbarians at the gate of Rome? Um, they're 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 on the horizon. <laughs> they're on the horizon. They're, <laughs> they're on yeah, the they're, horizon. They're on they the can horizon. salvage. I think they're if if we're being honest because we've been we've been uh, negative about the Astros. Um. I do think that they can they can salvage this year still. There's yeah. still time to salvage. There's still there's still but I think there's still a this year and next year window where things aren't gonna be well, I mean they're bad right now, but overall bad. Yes. Like things, uh, things are not trending well and the But twenty twenty six. The Reggie Jackson stuff speaks to I can kind of see where this is going and how this doesn't have a great ending. Like they're yeah. they're not gonna be the Dodgers who are good for no. twenty five straight years. They're not gonna be the Yankees who are never not good. It, th- there's gonna be an end point to this, and uh, yeah, I can I can see the see the finish line. And, and as you say that, that kind of I think leads me to the the point, and we'll move on after this. Uh, we'll, well, actually, we got one more Astros thing. We'll carry it over though. Uh, but that's kind of the point. Like I think. The remainder of this Astros run is really going to be coasting upon what they already have. Yeah. Oh. Like I have no faith in this five-team, uh, you know, turnkey with a fifteen-member panel, like actually adding to in and extending out the run. Like I think it'll basically run from what they already have and then naturally peter out over the next two to three years. That's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. It, I mean. In a way, it's just it's it's always up to the players, but I feel like with the Astros, it's like especially up to the guys who are on the team. It's up to well, Alex Bregman for one more year. Well, uh, well it's, yeah, because they're fiscally responsible, Sean. They will not resign it's, him. It's up to Altuve, uh, Jordan, Tucker. It's no, up not, to, not Tucker. He's the fiscal for the next two years. Okay, next two years. Uh, right. It's up to Yiner and Chaz and the pitchers. It's up to them basically to get this thing right because, yes, the days of like in 2018 and 19 where it felt like they just call someone up and it's like, oh, this guy's awesome. Like that, yeah, now they call days. up Spencer Arrigetti. He, he's well, he's their best pitcher the, over the weekend because he goes three innings. God. This is what a train wreck. All right, we got to get to break. Uh, one more uh, thing on the Astros when we get back. There's a certain member of the Houston sports media who has been uh, going full wrestling hill on Astros fans. So we got to play some audio from that gentleman and uh, have a conversation about it next when the bullpen returns. ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5.
Broadcasting live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, it's the Bullpen on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5, welcome back in. Bullpen, uh, you can join us on the conversation if you'd like to. Give us a call on the HRMP listener line. The number, if you want to w- talk about any Astros, or we'll get into the Rockets next segment, Texans later in the show, and of course, Mount Rushmore plus one at one thirty. But if you want to join us, give us a call. Again, HRMP listener line is 713-780-3776. That's 713-780-3776. So we were talking, obviously we spent the most of the show, or actually the entirety of the show, talking about the Astros. And basically all of it negative, because that's really the only material they've provided us at this point. Uh, but we tease going into break that there's an Astros, or a member of the Houston media that has a, maybe, a, I don't know if it's a contrarian, if you'd classify it as just a contrarian point of view or an intentionally antagonistic point of view, uh, but he's been lighting fires all over Astros social media with the discussion of batting lineup, specifically where Jordan Alvarez is in said batting lineup with Jordan being the two-hole hitter, uh, I believe, for the entire season for the Houston Astros. So let's hear from Jeremy Booth uh, firing back at Astros fans in his mentions for uh, the conversation of batting lineup. Opinion. Opinion. If you don't like what I do, and you still watch everything I do, you're still a fan. <laughs> you're still a fan, buddy. Okay? If you think what I'm saying isn't relevant, then shut it. Go watch something else. If you think what I'm saying is wrong, you're entitled to your opinion. Nothing you say to me is going to bother me. I literally sit there and I laugh about how asinine some of these responses are. And when the Astros have 10, 12, 14 hits and they get three runs, if you can't realize that's a problem in lineup construction, if you can't realize your manager, their manager, is trying to find the way to get Jordan Alvarez and Tucker and Kyle Tucker as many opportunities to drive in runs as possible, then you never need to watch the game again. Pumpkin, okay? Go do something else because that's what they want to do. Go watch basketball. Go watch hockey. Go watch soccer. I know. Go do some math. I love that. He oh, yeah. Freak out. <laughs> well, yeah, freak out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm justifiably in the position I'd rather not be in. Yeah. Um. Uh. Jeremy Booth right now is having his cup of coffee in the big time to continue <laughs> the Macho Man uh, Randy Savage uh, quotes. Um. Look, I, I, I think the tell, and other than that, well, there's multiple tells here. One tell on what he's saying is that when people like emphatically, I've learned this as a, someone who follows a lot of true crime things, when you, you see this interrogations, the more and more people like emphatically try to say something or like over use language like, uh, I literally do not care. Uh, the more and more people do that, the more and more they're lying about whatever they're saying. So I, I don't I don't buy for a second that uh, Mr. Booth doesn't care about what Astros Twitter is saying back to him. Well, uh, he, he said he literally doesn't Yeah, he care. literally doesn't care, which... It's he, asinine to him. <laughs> I, I would bet, you know, dollars to donuts that he does actually care a little bit, especially since mm-hmm. we found out some from some people on social media that he's been blocking a bunch of people, which is not something you do when you literally do not care. The other tell that I picked up on there, and this goes back to when he first starting, started fires last season, is he keeps referring to Joe Espada as your manager, as their manager. Like, because he was very vocal on... Why would like quality man or quality quality managerial candidates want to come to Houston with the way you've treated Dusty Baker in regards to Astros Twitter? So, I think this is very much taking something that Joe Espada has done that could could be conceived as maybe a little unorthodox, even though by analytics it's not, and then trying to put that on Joe Espada as a way to stay on the Dusty Baker was wrong uh, uh, frame of mind. So. I think that's kind of the tell and in, in where Jeremy Booth uh, is going with this uh, because the numbers don't back up his argument. Like, his whole thing is you can't b- bat Jordan second because he won't get RBI yeah. opportunities. I mean, that's why that that's why the Astros are falling short is because Jordan Alvarez is Right, exactly, because he's in the wrong season. spot. Like, clearly, they'd have a winning record if he was two spots f- further down yeah, in the lineup. Yeah, just, just put Alex Bregman in front of him. Yeah. And <laughs> all the problems go away. <laughs> this is just bad Jose Abreu in front of him. Uh, but But – and, if you want more guys on base. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just given the protection of having Jose Abreu behind him, everything will be fine. Uh, yeah, because, I, mean, I mean, Jose Abreu's hitting fifth. Clearly, you want Jordan fourth because 
because because because Jordan's going to see so many pitches to hit when uh, when uh, when Jose Abreu is behind him. But look, like the last two seasons, um, Jordan had 97 RBI both seasons. 97. Ryan Ladot. This year, again, early, it's April, but he's on pace for 130. Your whole argument of, well, if he's hitting second, he's not going to get RBI opportunities, completely falls apart yeah. when he's on pace for thir plus 33 RBI compared to the last two seasons. Now, that being said, because his argument is is nonsense, I don't. Again, I don't really think he believes this argument. I think he's trying to be antagonistic. And as a wrestling fan, I appreciate good heel work. Oh yeah, no, this is. I mean, this is quality entertainment. Like this is this is better than just you know anyone else just getting up there and being like, oh, you know, got got some issues with the starting rotation, got some issues uh, with you know you know doing the whole Bregman. Uh, Focusing on Bregman or Bray because everyone's focusing on a Bray, especially. Yeah, no, he's he's definitely the... this. This at least you know you're giving you get you're giving people a little bit uh, something else, and you're giving them something to really, honestly, to like care about. To like, it's it, there's almost a value in you know letting Astros fans unite uh, against, against the common enemy. Against a common enemy. It, last week. It was uh, the person who runs the Astros Twitter account. Yeah. This week it's Jeremy Booth. Mm -hmm. Next week, I don't know. Could could be you. Could be me. Uh, hey, look, I, I will take bullets. Whatever it takes. I will or take... the Astros start winning and the knives uh, stop coming or you know get put away. Well, they don't go put away. They just get redirected towards like Dodgers and Yankees fans. That's true. Yeah. That's right true. now they're inward, That's which is a problem. We got to start pointing them outward again. Yeah. So. Uh, Look, but I'll take bullets from Astros Twitter if it'll help the Astros get back on path. Uh, look, I, I, I again, it, it, to me, if you're getting super worked up about what Jeremy Booth has been saying, I think you're you're falling a little bit prey to the intentional nature of needling you for clicks. I, mean, I think that's kind of where this is headed. headed. That's why um, is it, it's CBS that he's on, right? The the local CBS affiliate that he's on quite a bit. I think it's Sports Sunday. I, with, thought, I thought it was Channel Two. Maybe oh, right. either way. There's a reason why they keep putting them on because when you, when they put them on, people get mad. People view people you know view the content on YouTube or whatever, and that, that's obviously good for the business of uh, of what they're doing. So I think you're falling a little bit prey when you when you uh, when you respond in the way you're doing. But I get it because he's clearly wrong. But I think sometimes you have to realize when you're being worked <laughs> as as a fan when you're when you're watching content like when you watch Skip Bayless, you know you're being worked. Oh, uh, he's and on I, he's not, on KHOU. But yes, yes, we are being we're being worked right now. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and w worked in uh, what's it, worked into uh, oh worked into a shoot. Yeah, yeah, we're being worked into a shoot. Yeah, we we started off having a fun back and forth that uh, was pretend, and now we worked into a legit shoot. Uh, hopefully. Uh, Hopefully none of us uh, get uh, CM Punk or Jack Perry and kicked out of the uh, kicked out of the business. But Definitely on the not. other on the other side, we'll talk about CM Punk I think a little bit later in the show because Johnny Belmer he can't get enough of professional wrestling. So I'm gonna I'll make sure we get professional wrestling in before the show's over. Uh, CM Punk was in UFC. Yes, so we can't we could talk I'll about take it. Yeah. We, we could talk about CM Punk because he had two UFC fights, so he, he that qualifies to to let Johnny talk let, for Johnny to let us talk about it. All right, on the side of the break, we're gonna get the Houston Rockets. Their season ends tomorrow. Uh, but we'll have some uh, uh, comments made by uh, Rockets head coach Ime Yudoka uh, about just, I don't think, I think just really toughness for his team. And it kind of lends to the question of who's going to be around for the rest of this Rockets rebuild. That and more when we turn to the bullpen, ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5.
This is The Bullpen on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here are the producers of ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Welcome back in ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. If you have any thoughts on what we talked about with the Astros or what we're going to discuss now with the Houston Rockets uh, with their season ending uh, tomorrow and just what we've seen from Jalen Green and maybe the future of this Rockets team, give us a call. On the HRMP listener line, 713-780-3776. So let's start, Sean, with, with Jalen Green because during March, I mean, we he was putting people in a position to talk about, okay, is he the best building piece they have? Is it not? Is it no longer Alper and Shingun? And then he kind of reverted back to the Jalen Green, every one-to-one to run out of town at the All-Star break because of how incons- inconsistent he was. So just the side-by-side of his two months, the last two months, it's pretty pretty damning as far as, you know, was March who he was or was March just a hot streak? So March, he was averaging 27.7 points per game, shooting 49% from the field, 40% from three. Uh, this month in April, obviously, le- fewer amount of games so far, but 10 points less per game at 17.7, 11% less from the field at 38%, and his uh, three-point percentage dropped by 12% from 40 down to 28%. So, where are you at with Jalen Green, what we've seen this season? There was a thing on Twitter, and I put it in the rundown for you to see if you haven't seen it already. Just like his stretches of games where he's gone either super hot or super cold. Which Jalen Green, I mean, again, he's like, what, 22? So there's still time for him to grow and improve and become more consistent. But where yeah. are you at with what version of Jalen Green is the Jalen Green that uh, is the real one in, as far as building around him uh, in the future? I mean, uh, honestly, what you would hope for is that you just get somewhere in the middle. Or you would hope that's the best. But, uh, sure, frankly, no one really is as good as he was in uh, – I mean, in the month of March, especially during that 27, 27 points per game while shooting 40% from three is Steph Curry stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, and for a lot of that month, it was like averaging 35 and yeah. shooting 50% right. from three. Like there's some, the if you were just to do like the middle 15 game or, you know, the win streak games. Right. He was, uh, he was playing absolutely insane. So, I ideally, what he needs to do is just to avoid the absolute stinker of all stinker games like he had um not last night but the game before against orlando was it i forgot yeah, they, they beat orlando yeah the the loss the game before that was against the jazz maybe it was the jazz game but okay. there's one where he played 19 minutes was one for seven from the field and an email uh, pulled him and we'll hear about yeah, that in a second yeah that that from that email uh post game uh press conference. i believe that is the orlando game yeah so that that's the one where he needs to avoid that. He needs to start avoiding the streaks of uh, that you put in the rundown where it's, you know, 16 points per game, 38 percent, 27 percent from three. That's his first 12 games. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need to avoid your lows being like, oh, my God, you cannot play this guy. 14 points per game, 37 uh, percent for the field, 22 percent from three. That was and, an 11 game stretch in the middle yes. of the year. And then, of course, the next 15. 29 points per game, uh, 49% from the field, 42% from three. So th- when it's good, it's good. Like when it's when he's good, it is. When it's good, he's a max player. Yes. But when he's bad, he doesn't need to be on the team at all. Yeah. That, it, that's a large. That, 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 that's the thing. Like you mentioned, like every player is going to have, you know, ups and downs. That's fine. You can't go from max player, one of the best 10 players in the league with numbers like that, to. You don't even deserve to be on the court. Yes, like that, that's that's you got to close the gap on that somewhere. Yes, I I mean it's what um, when Dallas came to Houston a couple weeks ago, um, and I think that was the game that ended the winning streak. That, uh, I the, believe you're right. The yeah. one that Dallas won. The uh, something that Kyrie Irving said in the post game press conference that like he was telling Jalen, it's like yeah, it's not about like being a star isn't just about the hot streaks it's about the consistency of ha- of you doing you playing like a star consistently and we saw that in some of the rockets win streak games where uh, jalen would have a poor first half and then would put it like kind of turn yeah. it on in the third quarter i, I, I wish i remember what was game the, it was there's there was a one- jazz game where he scored 20 of his like 29 points in uh just in the third quarter yeah and i, I think I, a I think, blazers I think game this, as well there was the one game where he had 38 
but like only he only had eight points a half. Yeah, yeah. It might have been like you said the the Jazz game, but let's right now let's hear from uh, uh, Rockets head coach Ime Udoka about Jalen Green specifically, but just I think overall, and this has kind of been a theme with him overall, and this is definitely the growing pains of a young team with a lot of 22-year-olds and, and under, people who can barely even drink, but it's just some of the inconsistencies and the lack, lack of toughness that uh, Coach Udoka has seen from his team. Guys look like they didn't want to play. Um, and consciously, subconsciously, uh, now that we're out of the race, looks like guys didn't want to play and packed it in, so... When you only got one guy really show up, Fred, early. That's what it's going to be, especially at the start. What do you want the team to learn in a game like this? To not repeat history and do what we did against Memphis when they sat everybody before All-Star break and um, do what we did against Brooklyn um, and what they've done for the last few years. So um, habits are hard to break and mentalities are hard to change. And that's why we are who, where we are record-wise and, um, you know, not – achieving our goals but you know you'd be better off saying you don't want to play and get people out there who really want to play so i mean i i think my my main takeaway other than obviously the question of will Jalen green be here long term is i freaking love uh, head coach Yudoka, man i i if, if he doesn't absolutely with his uh with his the way he approaches his like the tough way he approaches his team just drive everyone in the building crazy to the point where he gets fired if that doesn't happen i think it's going to work because i can <laughs> i think there could be a point where he's so tough and so hard nosed that he drives people crazy and then maybe a split happens but if that doesn't happen i think he's eventually going to get the results cuz he's talking about not meeting their goals when they're already at 40 freaking wins and like the vegas line was 31 and a half yeah. they it, won 22 games the year before he's far exceeded like you and i goals he's like man we can't meet our goals like bro you've had a great season with the win uh last night against the portland trailblazers the rockets got to 40 wins yeah and they, they played tomorrow final season finale to, with a chance to get to 500 40 wins is the most wins by the 11 seed in nba history yeah yeah <laughs> they, they're the uh -huh. best 11 seed in history any other year they would be in the play and they're and they're what what uh plus 18 or whatever from last season yeah. so uh, yeah it, it does it speaks to uh, the the but the idea that, that he's he still grinding like just it, that's the kind of the, sometimes you see the the thin line like hard nosed coaches like uh, Jeff Gun Jeff Van Gundy was this way like Bill Parcells Bill Belichick all these tough nosed you know, you know hard coaches sometimes I think wear on players after a while so that's kind of the 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 give the give and take of. But can you get the most out of them before you annoy them to the to the point of wanting to be out? But I I love what we I love that quote from Yudoka, and I'm really excited about whoever he picks to be on this team long term. They're going to figure things out and win in a big way. Yeah, and, and part of it is that normally the the players get tired of it after uh, some period of sustained success when they're like. Man. Man, you're still you're still right. riding riding us this hard, and you know we we've already you know all been on uh, in the Western Conference Finals finals. We we've had all the success, and chances are like one of these guys has to be a first team All NBA player for that to happen. So it's like there's a level of stardom that then you're like, you know what? I don't feel like putting up with a uh, coach who's <laughs> who's calling us out after the season's basically over. Like yeah. <laughs> a coach saying that we haven't met expectations when we increased the wins by 18 from the year before. It's like normally you have to be like there's some level of stardom that comes with the like I, I've i now tuned out my coach. And uh, I guess for the benefit of Ime Udoka, no one is really no one on the Rockets is really that big of a star to be like, man, I don't need to listen to this. Yeah, I mean, the most everyone else you can just everyone on the team, you can just go, what have you ever done? Yeah, I mean, the only guy who could say I've won a title would be Fred Van. Well, Jeff Green too. Like Jeff Green, Fred Van Vliet have won titles, but they're not they're not stars. Yeah, and and uh, Jeff uh, Fred Van Vliet was one of the only guys that uh, Ime or right. was the only he guy was the that only, Ime, you said he was the only guy that tried. Yeah, so I I think that I think that a Fred Van Vliet made man. He's not he's not. Well, he's only got one year, like one guaranteed year after this year. So <laughs> yeah, but, and honestly, you kind of hope you. you you hope he doesn't have a third year on that contract. You'd rather just decline him and then extend him at a lower number at for a better more rate, years. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, the 
as far as like who who on this team is like a Udoka guy. Let's th- carry that over. We're, we're, okay. We're 30 seconds before the top of the hour. So when we get back on the bullpen, ESPN Radio 97.5, 92.5, which guys are going to be around past this season on, on the Houston Rockets? Which guys are Ime Udoka guys? Which guys can stand his tough coaching and uh, be the players that uh, Coach Udoka wants them to be as this team moves forward into eventually making the playoffs? And we have a few more Rockets topics after that if we've got time. That when the bullpen returns on ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. This is the bullpen on ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Live from the Veritex Community Bank Studios, here are the producers of ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. Hour two bullpen starts right now on ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. If you've got any thoughts, you want to join in on the conversation, we're talking Rockets right now. We'll get into Texans X segment. We'll take your Astros thoughts as well. They suck. You want to tell us about it? Give us a call on the HRMP listener line at 713-780-3776. So we tease going into the break, Sean. Um, just kind of the idea, because we played in the last segment, if you didn't hear it, the the, the clip from uh, Ime Udoka, Rockets head coach, after their, I believe it was their win against Orlando in their last game, where Jalen Green got benched and Ime just calling out basically, Basically, the entire team except for Fred Van Vliet. Just put, <laughs> none of them had the energy he wanted him, uh, wanted him to have. None of them played with the mindset and the toughness he wanted to wanted him to have. And he really seems to be ha- have gotten frustrated this season. And I, I worthy, worthy, you know, I would say it's a worthy frustration with their effort level and focus throughout the season. And to some, to some degree, that can be expected because the large part of the roster is like twenty three and under. Uh, but it begs the question. You know, Fred, uh, Coach Yudoka, you know, has basically spent this season. Um, no, no one really thought they were going to make the playoffs. And despite getting to 40 wins, possibly getting to a 500 record and having the best record ever for an 11th seed, really this season was about evaluating, like, who's going to be a part of this build long term. So now that's the next part of this question. Uh, he see, clearly seems to be unhappy with everyone on the roster not named Fred Van Vliet. And Fred Van Vliet's not going one on five next season. So, Sean, who, who, uh, who do you think fits into being a, if I can use the, uh, sh- uh, I'm sorry, Johnny, I'm going to use a wrestling reference here to use who's a Paul Heyman guy. Who is an Ime Udoka guy? Who's Ime gonna, Udoka? Yeah, 
Did I? Oh, no. I went back to it. I've been so good today. You have been great. Damn it. That's why I noticed. Oh, you've been my so God. Good. All right. Who's uh, a Ime Udoka guy? Who's going to be on this team uh, for the long term? Who, who do you think fits into his style of play? So this is not a – this is not a – um who do I think or who do I who do I think should be, who do I think will be? This is just I am purely going off their Ime Udoka ness. Yes. I'm not going yes. off of anything else yes. other than your Ime Udoka. Correct. Perfectly perfectly phrased, yes. Fred Van Vliet, Dylan Brooks, Jay Sean Tate. Okay. <laughs> are my top three okay. of they play basketball the way uh the way Ime Udoka wants people to play basketball. I think as far as and People may uh, hear that lesson and be like, oh, my God, all those guys. I, I have the roster pulled up. All those guys were born between 1994 and 1996. <laughs> they're, they're, I didn't name a single person younger than 25. Which, <laughs> which is basically everyone else on the roster, not, yes. minus Jeff Green when, and, and, and Boban. Which is, I wouldn't say part of the problem, part of Ime Udoka's problem. Is It's part of the problem as he sees it is that these, you know, kids these days, you know. you know, Yeah, I mean, Gen um, Zers. Even though all the people I named are my age. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so then you go into, okay, who in this young core do we feel like is... Uh, is it fair to say, maybe it's fair? Maybe it's a more fair question because I don't think any one of the young core is there yet. Who do, I guess, who do you think can get there to being an Ime Yudoka guy? Tari Eason. Tari yeah. Eason is even even though he's sitting in the court side with the the warrior shirt, he still you think that's what that... Ime Udoka stuck up for him after okay. the, after right. the game. All right, he good. stuck up okay. for him. He said Very I would have I would have done the same thing, and uh, he was he said uh, I think he said like he got the sh- he has the same shirt the shirt he wore is mm-hmm. the is a similar one that he owns. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so he 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 was on Team Eason in that. Okay, he he doesn't mind poking the bear. It was it was backing Clearly, it up. That, yeah, Dylan Brooks is on his on, on a squad. Yeah, Clearly I mean, not. it's I mean it's part. Of, I mean, I think we said it when after that game happens. Like, well, part of the issue is that no one on on the team actually showed up. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tori the easy target, but no one on the team they got blown out. Um, number two, Amin Thompson. Amin Thompson. Yeah. The yeah, way he the call. way he's already playing as a as a rookie. You know, you remember. Yeah. He was a guy who was drafted and played and at overtime elite as a point guard. Was a ball in his hand, get to the rim point guard. And as uh, after um, Singoon went down, his role really changed to rim running center, <laughs> rim running yeah. center, offensive rebounds, and then also defend the toughest assignment on the other side when uh, Brooks is off the floor. It's like, that was kind of his, <laughs> his assignment. Definitely. Playing, a guy. playing hard nose defense and a lot, a ton of rebounds uh, for, for a guy, not just his size, but also like as young as he is, who again <laughs> is theoretically a point guard and to come in and play the way he does, uh, I th- I think those two are the one and two no doubters, uh, long term. Now you get, now you get to the real question. The remaining three of the young core with with Shingun, with Jalen Green, and Jabari Smith Jr. I mean, obviously, I mean that. Uh, I mean, obviously, Alpi's been out for a while, but he the he had similar comments about Alpi that he did Jalen in the clip that we heard about Jalen Green. I don't remember what game it was, but there was a game where where Yudoka killed Alpi for not playing well when the shot's not falling. Uh, so of those three, like, I mean, where, where are you at with their Yudokaness? Their Yudokaness. Again, this is not, I do not want this clipped out <laughs> as an order of their prospects. This is their order of prospects to play capital you- I, Ime Yudoka basketball. <laughs> uh, <laughs> trademark. <laughs> Ime Yudoka Capital basketball. I, Ime. You know? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it's tough. It's either Jabari or Shingun to me. Not surprising, uh, given uh, okay, given the let, reason. Let's, let's lean into that then. So I mean, <laughs> the name, the the only name that we're basically that you're basically saying like I don't see it at all as far as being Yudoka guy is Jalen Green. Like I, I mean, mean, because because and, and no, I'm not criticizing <laughs> you for it. I think it's absolutely fair. I think you're dead on. But it, it then goes to okay, well if he's not a Yudoka guy, and I do think as you're talking about this, I had this thought. You're mentioning like. The guys that are his guys, and you know they're not, they're not the young core. Like I can see Udoka as this team starts the starts to change and and take a different shape over the off season and making trades and making draft picks. 
I will not draft pick part of it, but I could see this team becoming a more veteran laden team, uh, maybe a moving a young piece out because Yudoka would prefer to to coach. Not, may, may, I'm not saying he's Van Gundy who would like refuse to play yeah. rookies, but I, I could see him being a guy that prefers to play veterans. So I mean, you're gonna have to move a young guy out if Jalen Green's the guy that we I guess view as least likely to get on board. I mean, what's the chances Jalen Green's not here when the season starts? That that becomes a question of who's available for trade because the 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 thing with Jalen Green is that as as uh, disappointed as Ime Udoka is, as inconsistent as he is, and how disappointed we are in the inconsistency, he still does have a lot of value. He would have a lot of value in a trade for a star player because normally these star player trades are just yeah we'll make the money work and here's all of our draft picks. Mm-hmm. To get an actual, like, oh, here's a guy who is at least, like, a young piece who, at least, if you are put yourself in the position of a team trading away, actually, put yourself in the position of the Houston Rockets in 2021 yeah. when they traded away James Harden. Getting someone back that you can go, oh, this was a guy who averaged 30 points in the m- month of March, who is uh, 21 years old, who is drafted highly, highly uh, regarded young player. That is at least someone where you can look at as part of a trade package of, okay, we're not just getting purely theoretical picks. We're at least getting a talented NBA player today that our coaching staff can work with and gives our fans a reason to keep showing up at games to watch this guy play. So he would have a lot of value in that. Now, is that trade chip, uh, Jalen Green, is, is you have to be careful w- with where you use that. Because do you well, just let's, want- let's put a name to it because it's the next thing in our rundown, like Donovan Mitchell. There's some rumors out there. Donovan Mitchell that is he the might most be avail- available. He's the most available star of, right. of so the offseason, which has not happened yet. So there's a quote. This is from the sign line on, on Twitter. Uh, Mitchell will be entering the final guaranteed year of his contract next season and uh, if there's no extension, leading to growing belief among rival teams that the Cavaliers will be forced to trade Mitchell in the coming months if they n- cannot come to terms with him on an extension so i mean hypothetically because you're gonna have to make contracts work obviously so you can't just put young guys in there's gonna have to be a contract so let's say either uh dylan brooks or fred van vliet for contract matching purposes plus Jalen green and some future first is that a trade you would make oh i mean yeah so uh, it would have to it would actually probably have to be like a jock landell like as far as like actually getting the contracts uh yeah i have to put this into the espn trade machine yeah well but it would have to be a high level contract that they're along with Jalen green because he's not getting paid yet part of it is like dylan brooks like no one i don't think anyone are like signing up to be like yeah give us dylan brooks please uh i i think he's yeah you might have to throw in hey okay let's let's up the like if you're trying to get also rid of the dylan brooks contract you're probably gonna have to throw even more so let's say Brooks, Jalen Green, Tari Eason, and a first. Or uh, what I would do is I would do uh, more picks, less than uh, le- less Tari Ar- T- 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 Eason. Yeah. Um, but what what the question really is is that someone of Jalen Green's uh, value of my, around the league? Do you want to trade in that chip for Donovan Mitchell, a guy who? I, I don't think he's ever made it out of the second round of the playoffs. Right. And he's 28, he's, so he's not he's not old, but he's, you know, he's closer. There's not, to, there's not an extra to, gear that you're going right. to get. You're kind of you're he's getting closer to, to the downside he than he is. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it be, then becomes a question of, of yeah, is, is the – do you want to be a team whose best player is Donovan Mitchell? And as we're seeing with the Cavs, they're the three or four seed in the – in the East, which the East is very weak. <laughs> the, yeah. I think they have like 49 wins, something like that, which would be like the eight seed or no, seven seed in the yeah, you West. Would, you, would, you would have to rely on, because you're right, like if Donovan Mitchell is your best player, it does, I think, I think it puts you in the playoffs, but it would limit your, your, your championship uh, mobility, your upward mobility, yeah. unless, and this is what you'd be relying on, you know, Alpi, uh, Amen Thompson and Jabari Smith Jr. have another gear that they haven't reached yet. That would be what you're relying on. So I think the answer is, or the answer would be to your question, like, are you willing to cash in that Jalen Green chip on Donovan Mitchell? I think the answer relies upon, do you believe those young guys then can 
be enough around Donovan Mitchell, Mitchell to actually be more than the Cavaliers are, are currently. Yeah. Do you think that Alper and Shingoon, because that's really who we're talking about the most yeah. uh, and, and right I, now. I, well, and Emin Thompson. And Emin Thompson. Yeah, not, you, not Jabari, but um, yeah, do you think Emin that, and Shingoon. Do you think that they have the upside to, uh, within the next two years, make a be on a team with Donovan Mitchell where Donovan Mitchell is the second best player and they Ooh. are the best player? Yeah. That, that is ultimately the question. Yeah, uh, that is how you take this team uh, to the next level. Now, maybe maybe it's not a Donovan Mitchell. Maybe it's someone better. I mean, we're we're already just kind of because it seems like Donovan Mitchell is already kind of out of right. uh, of Cleveland. But we see it every year. A team is going to lose earlier than they think they should in the playoffs, and and someone's going to want out of one of these situations. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the Phoenix Suns are in the play-in tournament right now. <laughs> like right, they, they, right. There's a good chance they don't even play a playoff game they don't actually make a seven game playoff series so there there's still going to be a lot of opportunities for guys to uh get a wandering eye or even for teams to be like why, why are we why are we running you, back this old crew that can't make it out of the first round do you think if the celtics come up short again they'd be li they'd listen to uh, a trade on either tatum or brown I think Brown would probably Brown is more likely because Tatum would be up for the uh, supermax this off season. Okay, and yeah, so that'd be tough. He, he also he would just be like lock that in, yeah. please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that too. That too. So it it would be Brown that becomes more available, and that is someone who you would think that Ime Udoka would be interested oh, in. Yeah, and that is someone who is again uh, probably twenty. In twenty seven range, yeah, I guess I he's say. slightly younger than Donovan Mitchell. He's he is twenty eight. Uh, twenty eight. Oh, so oh no, he's tw he's twenty seven right now. So okay, he'd be twenty eight. So he's next he's slightly younger yeah. than Donovan Mitchell. Um, but you can at least go. Well, he's always been the second, third best player, the third option on any on one of his right. Teams. That is, I mean, it's a concern, but it, it, well, I say it worked. They never got to the NBA Finals, but you the same would have been said about James Harden, and that they turned into a team that got to multiple Western Conference Finals, and yeah, so, and, and, and would have gotten to the finals if Chris Paul hadn't you know pulled his hamstring. And so. Brown's a three, four, three time All Star, so he he has been a guy who you know he's not a complete nobody who oh uh, no he's yeah i think he i think for most title teams he would be a two but I, I, there might be an upside and again if you think shagoon and amen thompson to a lesser degree jabari smith jr can take you know uh, a bigger leap then maybe that doesn't matter necessarily what the upper side or yes. upper side of the potential but is for Jalen brown at this point what we're saying is the uh a, a the second best player on a 63 win team <laughs> it's like if they <laughs> if they disappoint He's gonna one out where there's like you look at the Eastern Conference. There's like two teams that can probably beat the cat, yeah. beat the Celtics because the, and then we're talking about them losing the finals. They probably don't look to blow it up, blow it up then. But they are gonna get pretty expensive. They just resigned Drew Holiday too, so there there might be a financial aspect to that uh, move as well. So yeah, I think to bring it back, any any young piece that the Rockets are gonna trade, you have to keep in mind what are, what are we getting. You can't just trade them just to trade them because I think that's what the march that Jalen Green had. He kind of it, it really took Jalen Green out of the oh my god, just trade them, just get anything. Yes, yeah. where now it's the uh, you can you can afford to be picky. You can afford to be like, all right, let's see one more at least half season of this. Let's see it with Shingoon. Let's see what they can uh, what they can do together. Yeah, I think that's important um, uh, caveat there. The timeline on this is not, to me, this offseason. Yeah. I mean, um, unless you get a sweetheart deal maybe from somebody. But, yeah, I think you're talking about trade deadline next year. Uh, and most importantly, uh, right before we get to break, I, I think the most important thing for the Rockets is just be fiscally responsible. I think if we learn <laughs> anything today, uh, it's just you got to be – whatever decision they make, I just hope – you know, maybe they call Reggie Jackson, like, hey, Mr. October. Oh, I was going to say, uh, they not, call, not, not the NBA player. They call Hakeem Olajuwon. They yeah. call Sam Cassell. <laughs> they call Otis Thorpe. What's and, Robert Ori doing right now? And then um, and John Mar Starks, too. Mar <laughs> One random New York athlete. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, no, not Starks didn't have a. There was some random New York Nick that played on the team while, while Jeff Van Gundy was here. It wasn't John Sarks, but it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just be fiscally responsible, Rockets. All right, we got to get out because on the other side of the break, we're getting to the Houston Texans. But more specifically, the owners, Cal and Hannah McNair. A lot of good owner front, front office uh, audio this week. 
Cal and Hannah McNair had some uh, clips that we got to talk about on the other side of the break. ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. You're back inside the bullpen with the producers of ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. Sorry, Johnny was asking me a question during the break about the bloodline because clearly Johnny is turning into Johnny Wrestling. And, uh, you know, he's no longer a UFC fan. Johnny Uso. Yeah, Johnny Uso. He was asking me questions about the Usos. Uh, He didn't know if the bloodline story had ended, which clearly to me, Johnny t- says that Johnny Belmer has not been down since day one ish. Well, I seen people I on on Twitter know. like crying and celebrating, and I figured it came to a, you know a head or rap yeah, or whatever. One, it, Sean Sean pointed out some of the same things. The the tears, which man, it's a little much. Uh, whoa, whoa. But, but but the tears are because Roman Reigns had a uh, this title run that he just lost uh, the the Sunday last Sunday at WrestleMania to Cody Rhodes started back in August of 2020. So like. Uh, he, he's had, it's, uh, I believe the second longest title run uh, of anyone in company history, or I think he tied Hulk Hogan for that, um, behind only a guy from the seventies named Bruno San Martino. Uh, so yeah, it's just the historic nature of the run and carrying, cause he, he started that run when Vince McMahon was still in charge and now he's carried it through to the transition to the, to the much brighter days of triple H running the organization. So I think they're just celebrating him as being the guy that carried the company through COVID, through the dark, you know, final days of the Vince McMahon era. So it's more a celebration of, of Roman than anything else. But, uh, no, bloodline not over. Uh, anyway, and more wrestling will come up in the show. Sorry, Johnny. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, next two segments, wrestling will come up in the next two segments. But um, anyway, so Texans, Texans, sports. We're going to talk sports now. Sports. Uh, not sports, sports entertainment. Fellas. Yeah, real sports, damn it. Football. Uh, so uh, Texans owner Cal and Hannah McNair had some, uh, some I guess, some media availability this week. And there's a couple of clips that come at, came out that I want to play and have us respond to. Uh, just It's so funny, and it's pretty much universal for any clip where Cal and Hannah are talking together. It, Cal just goes on, look, and I, I, I love Uncle cool cat cow as jeremy calls them uncle cow love flip, cool flipping cat the cat. hamburgers i love them now because i know people like adults are in charge <laughs> that it doesn't like where it's okay it's okay for him okay. to be goofy i love I, him I now just, i just thought you're gonna go you know i love cal mcnair i was like i was gonna push back a yeah, little yeah, bit yeah, yeah. No, no 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 you're right i love him as like the mascot okay like, he's the mascot toro so, cal yeah, is what you <laughs> yes toro cal uh i could totally see him in that outfit 
Uh, but anyway, so it, it's funny when you listen to the two of them together because Cal just goes in these long, rambling, word salad, n- nonsense uh, uh, diatribes. And then <laughs> Hannah would just step in like, it's okay, honey. And like perfectly wrap up what he was trying to say in like two, three words. So let's listen to uh, two clips. First one, uh, Hannah and Cal talking about how the Texans are now in win now mode. Our boys, when they heard the Stefan Diggs news, were screaming around the house. And then their friends said their teacher stopped class to tell everyone. So there's quite a buzz amongst the younger generation about the guys that we brought in. So that's that's exciting. But And we embrace the expectations. That's where we want to be. And at the same time, it's about building the team yeah. and the team being coached and working hard. It's the day-to-day things that sure. are going to get us where we want to get to. But we've got to stay focused um, gotcha. you know, and work hard every day to bring about work where hard. we want to go. And we want to win now. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> hey, see? see? Johnny threw his hands up. It's laughing his ass off in the control room. They, yeah. The cow went on this. We want to win. We want to play games and play hard and play the right way. Gee. We got the right guys. We want to win now, Cal. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. That's why we made the Stephon Dick <laughs> trade. We want to win. That's why. People ask why. That's why. I can't do this whole great thing of like she had a personal story and it was it was you know it wasn't it wasn't you know improv material like or not like actual improv like but the building improv like a comedy comedy club it wasn't comedy club material but it was fun it was it was it was lighthearted and it it was entertaining and then cow just came in and talking about how we, we got the right players and the, the, the coaches s- to coach those right players we're gonna play the right way we want to win the yeah, spirit okay. of nick casario inhabited <laughs> the body of cal mcnair cal mcnair has the personality of a sweater vest like the, he's like kind of the human no is he what is he the human embodiment <laughs> of i don't know something <laughs> something boring the color beige like if you're watching some HD TV show and every they want to pay everything like some off white or beige, gonna, that's Cal McNair's personality. A recliner. <laughs> yes, yes. He just he seems a lazy like boy a, a human recliner is what he seems like. Because he looks he looks comfortable. He looks comfortable. Look, I, I would be comfortable. I, I'd home. love to grow up and be Cal McNair. I mean, partly because of the billions, but uh, yeah, no, just uh, okay. Another clip, so we make sure we get out on time here because Mount Rushmore on the other side. Uh, Hannah and Cal, uh, Cal McNair on Stefan Diggs being a diva. Why do you think that he will be a good fit here in this organization? Do you think I'm a diva? Am I a diva? <laughs> no, not, I said Stefan Diggs, not you. I mean, I don't know. It depends on what your definition is. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't really know, know him yet. I look forward to getting to know him. I think as a receiver, you probably want the ball. And I think as team, you you want receivers that want the ball and want to make a difference with it once they get their hands on it. And I think he's one of those guys that can make a difference. And I'm glad he's here, and I look forward to uh, getting to know him. I think we have a team uh, that really works together well. And I think um, they'll challenge – if he goes off a little bit, they'll probably challenge him and bring him back in. But they'll work together as a team, and I look forward to that. And this is where you trust your evaluators, right? Right. I think we have a good culture in our locker room that he's coming into, and um, I think I think he's a great fit. With, with oh, you want to win, cut it there. Yeah, there. You want cut guys there. that want to win. I mean, Hannah Perfect is like, we got a good culture. They'll rein them back in if they need to. We're gonna win. Like it's just like and Cal went his whole thing. He's like he's a you know he's a wide receiver, wide receivers. Wide, you want wide receivers. You want that wide receivers to yeah. be wide receivers, and you want wide receivers who want the ball. And we want guys who want the ball, and we got guys who get them. God, he just is so boring. I like the diva talk at the start. Yeah, that, he did. Hannah was fun. She had <laughs> both. She was a little spicy. He was like, okay, what's a diva? She had a little bit of, you know, attitude back push, and forth. Push with back the, on Randy McAvoy. Yes, yeah. it was fun. And then Cal just came in and put the entire media to sleep. It just, oh, my God. I, I, don't, I don't think Hannah McNair's a diva. I don't either. Okay. I don't either. Just to answer her question. Just, yeah, I, I have no reason She's to call her diva. a diva. No. no. That goes back to a... Everything is wrestling. Goes back to a very regrettable time <laughs> in wrestling when they used to call the women's championship the Divas Championship. Uh, wrestling, anyway. All right, that'll uh, that, <laughs> more be, wrestling coming that, up. Yeah, more wrestling coming up now. Well, sort of, sort of. On the other side of the break, that'll that'll wrap Texan saga. I just wanted to have some fun with Cal McNair being extremely yeah. boring, I, and then Ham McNair stepping in and, and doing his job way better in three seconds. The Texans are really like the the palate cleanser for. 
for having to talk about the Astros at yes. this point. Like yes. the Rockets are kind of neutral. I mean, they're literally either going to be one forty-one game. and forty-one. <laughs> they're they're going to be five hundred or one game under. Yeah, where where the Texans, it's like ah. Uh, Nothing but good vibes with the Texans. Even Cal McNair's boring ass. At least, <laughs> at least, at least his we wife's can, interesting. We, yeah, we can still have fun with it. What What did you think of those clips, Johnny B? Are you, are we, do you fall asleep in the and back there in the control room? Uh, when no, Cal my, started talking. No, my favorite part was uh, y'all's ad libs during it. Like I hear Sean go facts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Right when Cal said wide receivers want the ball, he's like, facts. I yeah. loved it. I mean, yeah. that's what. I, that, I, that's, that, good, that's the only that way to the... listen to Cal McNair is like when people are making fun of him. Yeah. If it's not that, then yes, you fall asleep. You know, I, I like I, I'm you know what? During the break, we should go to some uh, draft profiles that Lance Sterling has written on wide receivers and see if one of the positive traits he has written there is wants, wants the, the ball. ball. Yeah, because uh, if, if he does it, then, you know, Did, I he, think that's a problem. I had to I, have written up George Pickens. Let me <laughs> let me look up George. Pickens. Yeah, I'm not convinced draft, George Pickens wants the ball. There's not, I'm not entirely convinced on that. If he did want a ball, maybe he shouldn't uh, be. Well, it's not his fault, but don't be on a team with uh, with uh, Kenny Pickett. That's that's kind of a problem. Anyway, on the side of the break, our ground breaking award winning segment, Mount Rushmore Plus One, when the bullpen returns on ESPN Radio 97.5 and Welcome in, Houston, to the best part of your week. It is time for the groundbreaking, award-winning segment, Mount Rushmore Plus One, here on the bullpen, ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5, where, uh, you know, myself, Sean Mapes, Johnny Belmer, we don't give top five lists here on the bullpen. No. That's, that's, that's mundane. It's been done that, before. Yeah. It's uncreative. It's uninspiring. We do Mount Rushmore Plus One because we're innovators, Sean. Innovators. Uh, innovators of this sports radio game. Who is going first today with your innovative Mount Rushmore plus one? We didn't talk about this before. No, maybe we, maybe we should have talked about I this during it. the break. This is innovation right here. <laughs> this is innovation. Like the innovation, the next not, level of sports radio not being is not planning prepared. out your segments. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, exactly. I can go first. All right, go, go ahead, Sean. 
Mount Rushmore plus one of Great Falls. <laughs> is, it, is this, uh, no, uh, phrasing, Brian, phrasing. Is this in response to OJ dying? <laughs> the fall of, because we did a, we did no. a bit when OJ died about like the, the biggest falls from grace no, for, for athletes. No, well, although, yeah. Should have thought of that. Okay, that's, that's all a right, pretty right. good one. No, just Stay tuned. just things that have fallen, and okay. uh, I uh, put them on a Mount Rushmore plus one. Well, okay, how did this list come up? Did you fall down? Are you like, hey, what else did fall down? Like, no, well, no, what's, the, what's the inspiration? You'll see. You'll okay, see. The all right, all right, all right. Go ahead. We just heard. Uh, we just heard one of our one of our uh, what forty six previous presidents uh, mentioned this. Yes, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah, yeah, it did. Gorbachev finally tore down that yes, wall. Yes, they listened to him. They hired a contractor. They, <laughs> they hired a contractor, yes. Uh, Do you think they went to Angie's list for that? <laughs> I heard it's just Angie. Oh, now. it's right. It's just Angie. Um, You're right. The Roman Empire. <laughs> but, what, yeah, which we now kind of in with the with the Houston Astros. The Barbarians are at the gate. Speaking of the Houston Astros, the fall of 2017. Oh, God. The fall, huh? Yeah, yeah. Astros World Series. Deshaun Watson. Mm-hmm. Back when we didn't know that much about Deshaun Watson's personal <laughs> life. Back when we were sa- back when we were sad when he got hurt. Yeah. <laughs> now we so don't. Re- now fair we don't trade. Quite- fair trade. Looking back on it. Yeah, God, we don't have his quite ACL the- for a World Series t- <laughs> title. Mm. Yeah. Uh, who will? Who will? Who's? Uh, all right. We had it. We minor minor diversion here. Like uh, who's uh, Tom Herman's first year at UT? No. Uh, <laughs> well, we, we could bring up if you're a good teammate based upon the, the color of your urine. No, but no, not Tom Herman's first on. year. Like, uh, like, so we sacrificed uh, Deshaun Watson's ACL for a World Series title. So it's yeah. time for the Astros to return the, the favor. Who's you? Uh, who's the entire you, pitching set. Who's UCL? Would you sacrifice for a Texas? <laughs> I mean, they're already Super Bowl. doing that. But literally, the starting the the starting rotation for the 2022 can, can World Series light, is on the injured list. Just right light now. them all up and snap, snap, <laughs> just snap all the UCLs in a row. And then uh-huh. we. Uh, anyway, go ahead. Next on the Mount Rushmore plus one of Great Falls, Niagara. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I knew that <laughs> somewhere out there, there's going to be like a very literal fall. Niagara. I, I was waiting for where, where it was yeah. going to be Any time a list. president falls is pretty funny. Uh, um, that's shout, a, shout out to Joe Biden. Shout out to Joe Biden, Gerald Ford. Yeah. <laughs> Many of our great presidents yeah. have fallen. Uh, and uh, But last but not least, the Houston Astros. Oh, so Astros got on here twice. Well, sort of twice. Well, the fall of 2017. <laughs> and now just the... The, the fall, the, the fall of their, yes. of their dynasty. Yeah, OJ Simpson was a good one. How did I not think? Of I don't know. Did he fall in the Hertz commercial? He, well, no, but I think he did fall down in one of the oh, uh, naked gun, naked gun did, movies. He, yes. he fell out of the boat. Yeah, yeah. I think he <laughs> fell out of everything. That was part of like a running gag in the movies. I think he fell down in an escalator once. Is, is your Mount Rushmore plus one OJ Simpson uh, acting performance? No, it's uh, my Mount Rushmore plus one is best OJ Simpson uh, seasons as a Buffalo Bill. Remember the man as an athlete. Yeah. <laughs> People forget he was a problem. We we, we didn't get to get to this because we had to skip our leftovers. We got we got behind. But yeah, the the PFT commenter tweet that started the whole thing with Jose Canseco with Heaven just got a great running back. <laughs> Say what you want about OJ Simpson. <laughs> the guy could run the football. He he yeah he he was uh, very elusive. Definitely he was very elusive. All right, uh, breakaway J- speed. Johnny, uh, what is your Mount Rushmore plus one this week? Okay, I guess it's my turn. It uh, is all true. right, well, if you don't want to go no, next, I'll, I'll go next. I'll, I'll go ahead here. and go. Diva. Uh, oh, really? We want a producer who wants the microphone. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> your draft profile, I'm going to rewrite it right yeah. now. Oh, man. I-, I wish I was a diva. I could demand more money, uh, be a little more <laughs> demanding. We want you know? producers who want the microphone, who want to say things on the microphone, and you then do a pretty podcast good what they say on the yeah. microphone. You do a good count. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, my uh, Mount Rushmore plus one is inspired by uh, UFC 300 tonight. Fake. Uh, yeah, I know. Fake <laughs> I knew you were going to have some Fake kind of sport. snark comment here. They're, hey, they're owned by the same company. They are. <laughs> That's technically. true. Difference uh, true. Yeah, but one this is, is friendly fire now. But, but one is a real fighting, and one is yeah, exactly. grown men in tights yeah. hugging each other all yeah, over UFC. the, the, you got the it. ring. I'm, I'm glad you got it, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Both are technically that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number uh, number five, or actually, I didn't even tell you what it is yet. Uh, I'm going to do uh, my top five favorite UFC post-fight moments. Oh, uh, yeah. Here. Okay. Uh, number five, I've got Chael Sonnen. Um, after he had already lost to Anderson Silva, uh, he then demanded a rematch 
from Anderson Silva and said that if he lost, he would leave the UFC. <laughs> And then proceeded to get his ass kicked and then ignore it like it never happened <laughs> and just keep fighting. I just I just love Very that. Very mad dog Russo of him. Yes. Yeah. Um number four is not a post fight uh conference, but it was before the fight, but I love it anyways. Uh John Jones told Daniel Cormier, quote, You look like a crackhead in a suit. Uh and then D- DC replied, Well, at least I'm not an actual crackhead. Uh, <laughs> you know, John Jones, uh, drug addict. Um uh number three, I've got uh, Connor McGregor. Uh, the, the iconic. Who the bleep is this guy? Well, that's one. Okay. But I would the like iconic, to apologize. I'd like this to take this chance to apologize to absolutely nobody. <laughs> great, you know, that's that clip. Great, great mic skills. Oh from, yeah, from all the notorious. Absolutely. Uh, and so then. Well, he, 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 he did could. you see the he new could. Roadhouse? I, yeah, he, 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 he could. Would, he, if he, there was, there's been these rumors before in Conor McGregor. He would absolutely have a career in WWE yeah. if you wanted it. And act, and movies and yeah. everything else. Yeah, he's got it. Uh, number two, I've got Khabib jumping over the cage to, oh, yeah. to fight. That, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. That's great. Uh, amazing. And then number one, uh, my guy Derek Lewis, uh, when asked why <laughs> he beast. took his pants off, he said, because my balls was hot. Uh, greatest quote in a post-fight interview ever. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an all-time really. classic. Shout out to the Houston native uh, there with uh, Derek Lewis. That's that's awesome. All right, so my Mount Rushmore plus one, as you might have guessed, because I teased it a couple times. It's uh, with the real sport of professional wrestling related. And I, I'm, I'm more, I, I, I'm, I'm doing a service for the newer of the sports entertainment fans, uh, Mr. John. Sean Mapes to my oh. right. Oh. Uh, in part because you were like three years old when this happened, or four years old. Uh, but I don't know if you noticed, but WCW 2000 was trending briefly over the weekend because AEW did some very questionable things, some of which we might talk about in the next segment, which had people talking about the end of days of WCW before they folded in 2001, which, which were just, just like the worst of the worst booking decisions you could possibly make. So my Mount Rushmore plus one is the worst decisions – WCW made at the end, okay. and I, I, I kind of want to read them, and I don't know if you want to try to guess what it's about, not maybe not guess what it's about, but just kind of, I want to just read what it was and have you react to it okay. wherever you want to go with it. All right. So, uh, the first one, this is probably the, the most mundane of the, of the top five, and it's kind of a tie. They had two moments, uh, one labeled as the finger poke of doom, and another where Jeff Jarrett, at the beginning of a match, just completely broke kayfabe and laid down to let Hulk Hogan pin him because they made a whole point of Hulk Hogan having creative control and they were mad about it. So they just completely called out the, like the realness or like the perceived realness of the fight and lay down. It's like, here, if you want to pin me, pin me. So there's, there's protests too. There's uh, protests. Yeah. So basically it was, you know, Hulk Hogan has creative control. He doesn't want to play ball. And so Vince Did Russo, Hulk Hogan ever lose when he had creative control? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He lost to Goldberg. Yeah. Okay. He lost to Goldberg. He lost to a few others. And he, he, uh, the finger poke of doom was the, again, kind of playing on the realness of the sport. They did a whole bit where Kevin Nash literally went up to Hulk Hogan, or I'm sorry, Hulk Hogan went up to Kevin Nash, poked him in the chest with his finger. He flopped down, pinned him one, two, three. And that, it, it, anyway, it was, it's a little bit silly. Now we get into the real crazy stuff that <laughs> led to the downfall of WCW. Uh, and, and, and why I don't think AEW could ever top this one. David Arquette, you familiar with David Arquette, the actor? No, no. I didn't oh, know he was okay, an actor, okay. Johnny Bilmer, no, um, okay. So uh, he, I, I he can was, he was get in the, acquainted with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Google him. He was in the original Scream movies, as, as you're googling. Okay. You might recognize his face when you when you see. Oh yeah, him. I've you, seen him before. Okay, he was a world champion at one point, Sean Mapes. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was a WCW world champion at one point. He was in some like multi man match, and they did a bit. In, in a desperate ploy for ratings and attention because their business was collapsing all around them. They made David Arquette the world champion. Wow. Uh, spoiler alert, it did not work. Wow. And he went on to be in the adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl. <laughs> that is a... That's that's where we know him. That's, oh, is that where you know him? <laughs> that's, where, that's where we know him. All right. So uh, the, the next three are... Oh, man, they're, they're as bad as it gets. Two of them are pretty self-explanatory. One of them you might not get right away, but I'll show you a picture. And for those at home, obviously Google it as soon as you can, and you'll see why it was so comical. Uh, but they got really heavy into very, very over-the-top gimmick matches because they had no other ideas, and they were trying to get people to turn in, tune in just because they were doing wacky stuff. So they had a series of gimmick matches where everything was put on a pole. They had put contracts on a pole. They put everything on a pole. All... Uh, uh, all, like a like a physical pole. Yeah, climaxing intentional word use. Climaxing with the Viagra on a pole match. They literally had a Viagra 
bottle on a on a pole match at one point in WCW in 2000. Like it's money in the bank, like <laughs> kind of. So the story was one of the wrestlers was was with this uh, really hot woman named Tori Wilson, who was kind of like a manager at the time. And the storyline was he what he couldn't get it up. So he had a match against one okay, of his. Okay, <laughs> just that's the storyline. Yeah, that's the, that's the little storyline. So he had a match with his rival, and they they put a Viagra pill bottle. And I'll, I'll show you the picture. Do you want to win that match? Uh, well, if you want to be able to please your super hot girlfriend, I guess so. But oh, they, I get. I guess that's yeah. yeah okay. uh, so they put the bottle of Viagra up on the pole, and he had to beat his opponent and then go get the the Viagra bottle, which they did the cheapest job ever making this bottle of Viagra, as I'm showing Sean Mapes. Yeah, it, it, it's it, just it a looks, bottle. It, it looks straight out of like the 1800s, yeah, so like yeah. what, a bottle from the 1800s. It's like a movie prop. Yeah, exactly. So. The Viagra on a pole match uh, did not help save WCW from uh, eventually uh, foreclosing. Next one, they elevated the game from putting things on a pole. And one of the wrestlers, Buff Bagwell, uh, he was in a feud with a guy who I don't remember. And the premise of this match was he had to put something even more priceless than about bottle of Viagra on a, okay. on a pole. They put his mom on a forklift, and he had to win the match to be able to get his mom safely lowered down from the forklift. Because otherwise, the villain was just, I guess, going to keep her up there. Like, what is the end game? Like, if the villain wins, what's going to happen? Drop her. Is just going to is he going to lean the- is, is he going to lean forward? Is he just going to keep her up there? Like, I don't know what the the end game of that was. But they literally yeah, that's put, a good one. They literally put someone the the, the, the it's high stakes. The gimmick of the match was Judy Bagwell on a forklift. <laughs> and there's a, here. I'll show you the picture again. If you're at home. You got to Google this. But here's Judy Bagwell sitting on top of yeah. a damn forklift. She, she sure is. Oh, wow, standing, too. That was... uh, yeah, I don't know if OSHA uh, sanctioned yeah. necessarily. Well, I was thinking, like, you would sit on it or should be, like, tied to it. Yeah. Like, like yeah. you know, like a railroad track uh Oh, like an, eight, like an 1800s movie <laughs> villain? Yeah, yeah, sure. The, the damsel in distress, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Last one on the list, They uh, another desperate ploy for ratings. This was a little bit before 2000, uh, but they tried to uh, – Make a character for some reason based off the Mar- the Mortal Kombat character uh, Sub Zero. You familiar with Sub Zero? Yes. Uh, so they they came up with this character named Glacier. Again, Google it. I'm showing a picture to Sean. What? It- Why would you? Okay, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> It, 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 like just seeing the picture is that actually not enough. Really, you really got to Google the video of like his debut. Like they had this whole over the top as you would you know theatrical entrance with lights and smoke and like perceived i guess perceived to be cold or whatever and then he goes out and has a terrible match and no one cares at all because he's he's dressed up like sub zero why would you choose a person who has literal superpowers <laughs> like if you're gonna he can't be sub zero yeah yeah like he can't do the it. whole point yeah he <laughs> can't do it get, get wrap some some tin foil on someone's <laughs> arms and call him jacks like like what are you like like, why would you choose the hardest thing? Yeah, to do? what do you mean to be Scorpion? Just, you know, get over here. And, like, <laughs> that's at least a gimmick <laughs> and, like, that yeah. you can pull off. Yeah, maybe he can have like a hook and he like throws it at someone, pulls him in. Glacier, he can't make the ice. <laughs> Unless you're going to do that, you cannot do it. Yeah, yeah. So, as, as you, if you ever wonder why WCW went out of business, there were five reasons I just gave you why they couple, went out of business. A couple of them, I don't know. You know I, I, tweak them a little bit. I have I a feeling you work. might go home and watch Judy Bagwell in a forklift match. I might. Or I that might. or the Viagra on a pole match. Yeah, yeah. Either one, <laughs> honestly. All right. ESPN Radio 97.5 and 925. We got to get out. We're a little bit over. One segment left this week, and then programming note we will be off for the next two weeks. Because Sean is going to God's country, Austin, to watch the spring game of the Longhorns. Yes. It's and also, then, also my birthday. Also yeah. your birthday. I know. <laughs> damn it. It's, well, insider baseball. It's also my wife's birthday. <laughs> and then I will be off the following weekend uh, because I'm taking my wife to something uh, for her birthday. So we, the show will be off the next two weeks, but we will return the first week of May. Sorry, John. Uh, yeah, sorry, John. No, you're, you're let go. I'm, my, my bad. This is. I didn't want you to find out this way, but you're temporary. Let it go. Can I? Can and I just we'll, wait till you come back? You gotta no, let me go. No, no, we're gonna let you go, and then we'll rehire you first week of May. Yeah. So it, it look. It's talk to talk to HR. It's fine. You'll, you'll be fine. It'll be taken care of. Not really, but we're gonna tell you that anyway. One segment left this week on ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5.
You're back inside the bullpen with the producers of ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5. Welcome back in. One final segment today for the bullpen. Again, programming note will be off the next two weeks. Uh, I'll be back that first Saturday in May. It's time to finish the show as we always do with the worst people in sports this week and the things we love from sports this week. But first... We got to bury those people who are the worst in sports this week. Sean, worst person in sports this week is? Is golfer Wyndham Clark for honestly disrespecting the good people at not just the Masters, but also uh, Augusta National for comparing it to uh, Live. Yeah, we got 54 holes, you know, and in Live Golf, that's they only play 54. So uh, I like my chances. We got a lot of, lot of golf left and... Uh, yeah, I mean, as you can see, someone shot seven under. I, I could do that tomorrow. So, well, two- I mean, Lee sounds confident. I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to find out like how how it went for him in the next day. He sounds like he's confident. He's ready to make the rebound. I, how did it go for him, Sean? Like he he rebounded like just like you said, yeah, right? I he mean, shot seven under. Well, he shot six over actually and missed the oh, cut. Oh, yeah, wow. mm, yeah. yeah. So damn. he didn't. He in fairness, he didn't actually have to play all fifty four <laughs> holes. I mean, only played thirty six. So. Yeah, it's not good for me in the Killer Bees Master Pool. I had I had Wyndham Clark. That's not oh, great. Why you yeah. pick this guy? I don't it's know. I, I should have let you pick my entire list. You gave me more Akawa. He's doing well because <laughs> uh, I follow. I, I super super follow uh, golf. Right. Uh, okay. My uh, worst person in sports this week is the president, CEO, head booker, whatever of AEW, Tony Khan, not Nick Khan. It's very confusing, as Sean pointed out before the show, to have two two people with the same last name, not related, both running wrestling companies. Different Di- wrestling. Different wrestling companies. But Tony Khan decided to try to, after CM Punk went on the um, MMA Hour podcast with Ariel Hawani, tried to, I guess, fact check what, uh, what uh, CM Punk said. And then he shows the video of the fight that happens at All in London and completely proves what CM Punk said. So if you if you haven't heard what CM Punk said as far as, his fight with Jack Perry, what eventually got him kicked out of AEW. Here's what CM Punk had to say. Jack came back from his match. I was the next match. I'm sitting there. And I got I got people with me. I'm not going to say who they are, you know, because I got a lot of friends who work there, and I, I, I wish them all well, and I don't, don't want them to be punished because they're friends with me. You know, and I walk up to him, and I'm just like, Jack, why do you insist on doing this dumb internet shit? like on on tv you know and he's just like well if you got a problem about it do something about it and i was just like man come on man (laughs) you know i'll kill you (laughs) like what are we doing you know and it just you know it's like chael says sometimes he just can't let you get close you know i thought i was doing a responsible thing you know i didn't punch anybody i just choked somebody a little bit (laughs) samoa joe was there (laughs) told me to stop and then I quit. I turned to Tony and I said, this place is a f- joke, man. You're a clown. I quit. Tony, Tony Khan, you're a clown. I quit. And it's funny because they, they, they did the responsible up, thing. I just choked I, him. I, Samoa Joe was there. That, that is the line of the year. It's like, I did, I did the responsible thing. I didn't punch him. I just choked somebody. Samoa then, Joe was there. Yeah, that, <laughs> the second part is the key part. <laughs> Samoa Joe was there. And, and, and the footage, they AEW finally, because this happened in August. They finally showed the footage. Um... Uh, which they're apparently could get in some trouble for because the CCTV footage over in England, apparently you're not legally allowed to use that unless all parties give consent. So this is funny how it could backfire on another way. But he shows the video as it's, as, as if it's some sort of vindication for AEW, and it clearly shows exactly what CM Punk said word for word. And, by the way, you can't see Samoa Joe in the footage. He Good. is there. He yeah. is indeed there. So, Tony Khan, you are the worst person in sports this week. All right, we're, we're done with the Anger Sharks. Time to backstroke over to the sea of tranquility yeah. and talk about the oh actually we do have one more worst thing in sports quickly johnny what's your worst no thing it's okay sports? we're out of time mine we're was time. angel okay. hernandez all right oh yeah, well, okay universal all right universal. I'll, I'll just say the name and johnny you play the clip the thing i love from sports this week kevin harlan pelicans hold on driving into murray somebody's throwing something on the floor 46 seconds to go and a whistle blew it's a chicken wing <laughs> Why would someone throw something that good out on the floor? <laughs> it's crispy. Yes. It's warm. Yes. And I almost had to go out. And be, I'm so hungry. 
Uh, I hear your stomach over here growling. What's that guy? I hope he eats it. <laughs> He's going to save it for a put it in that little heater over there. 46 seconds to go. It's Murphy with the ball and Fox, the quick foul. Oh, man. Kevin Hartland's a national treasure. I want him on the call of, the every, best. of every game that I listen to. Especially I, I if things get a little wonky. Yeah, the, his ability to transition into something crazy like that or like the drunk guy. The drunk guy's on the field. He's, he's drunk, <laughs> and now his shirt's off. And then completely, smoothly transition back into the game. Yeah. No one beats him. Sean, your uh, your best thing from sports this week. What'd best thing in sports this week are the young, feisty Rockets. You had, the, a, you had rookie Cam Whitmore in the game against uh, the Jazz on Thursday. Uh, making a shot and then pointing and staring down jazz coach Will Hardy. Love for, it. Uh, F the jazz. For no discernible reason, really. Because F the jazz. I, okay. And then last night we had Amin Thompson. Uh, there was a call uh, on the court. Uh, Chauncey Billups was complaining about the uh, call wasn't foul. Amin Thompson told gave him the signal to challenge it. <laughs> um, Chauncey Billups then challenged it. Challenge like unsuccessful. <laughs> nice. All right, that'll do it for the bullpen. ESPN Radio 97.5 and 92.5 for Johnny Belmer. For Sean Mapes, I'm Brian McDonald. Again, we're off the next two weeks. See you in May, Houston. Have a great weekend.